Good evening. My name is Dave Robbins. This is The Art of Politics. Uh, Co-host Ken Gidge is off tonight. He'll be back next week. Uh, we have a wonderful guest today uh, who's come in and we're going to be talking with. It is former House Speaker Bill O'Brien from Mount Vernon. Bill, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming down. Thank you for having me on. I, I, I was looking forward to it. Well, I, I, uh, I, like, I like hearing that. Um, and... Uh, a lot of stuff has happened since we last spoke. We, you were here before the election, that's and right, that's uh, right. uh, we were we were waiting to see what would happen. But what did happen? What happened in November? What's your assessment? Oh, I think the the Democrats did something very traditional and used um, very untraditional uh, tools to do it. They turned out the vote. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did it in ways that I think were, was, uh, were very proficient. Um, you know, my hat's off to them. They identified um, folks who weren't registered but were uh, sympathetic to their message uh, and, and brought them in and, and had, got their votes. They were able to micro-target constituencies with um, messages that uh, to many of us seem to be um, lacking in, in uh, persuasiveness and, and information, but weren't to the voters that they were targeting. And uh, they, they put together a, a, a good, solid majority, and, you know, my hat's off to them. Well, that's, that's gracious of you. And uh, uh, you, you were a speaker. You're now uh, not speaker and not in the minority leadership. Uh, I was a state representative, and I'm now on the sidelines. And... Uh, uh, Co-host Ken Gidge, who's not here, is uh, is still a member of the legislature and and uh, did very well. He was, I believe, the top vote getter in his ward and uh, one of the top vote getters in in the city of Nashua. Um, so things have changed. Uh, Republican uh, majority in the House went from approximately 300 Republicans to 100 Democrats to now approximately 180 Republicans and 220 Democrats. Tremendous, tremendous shift. What do you see happening next time around? We are subject in this state to wave elections. If you look at the elections that have been taking place um, pretty much over this past decade going into the, the, uh, the current decade, um, we've had substantial uh, majorities shifting back and forth. In 2002, if I remember correctly, there was... 283 Republicans uh, elected out of the 400-member House. Uh, we had 297 elected. And uh, in, in both instances, in, in pretty short order, it went to a, a, a Democrat majority. Uh, in particular, during presidential years, we're very much subject in, in the legislature to what's going on in the ballot above us. Let me tell you why. Um, I think that's important. If you look at the um, 2008 election, which was a presidential election year, uh, the uh, winning percentages on the part of the Democrats were similar to what we saw in the 2012 election. And uh, the makeup of the House was very similar. As a matter of fact, we did a little bit better this time. Um, so I think there's a lot of voters who come in, particularly during presidential years, with a, uh, an intent to vote a party and then sort of move their way down the ballot um, to vote for uh, uh, offices, uh, uh, candidates who are seeking those, those offices in, in, uh, from the same party that they are voting for, for you know, Congress and, and president. 
All right. Well, if if uh, if the if the ballot were a poodle, uh, we as state representatives would be the very the very last tuft of the tail. And, uh, and is, the tail's not wagging the uh, dog here. That, <laughs> that's, that no, very very definitely not. Is there as uh, well? I kind of make life all about me, and, and so I'm going to do that for just a minute here. Is there anything I could have done as a Republican, as a, as a moderate Republican in South Nashua, which in a, in a district which goes back and forth, uh, anything that I could have done to win this election? I lost by a couple of hundred votes. Well, you know, I, I uh, wasn't tracking any individual race. Mm -hmm. My sense is you probably worked pretty hard at it. Um, and spent an unconscionable amount of money out of my own pocket. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, and so the answer is probably no. Um, on the other hand, uh, in my district, for example, uh, I was aware that they were targeting me. I don't think the Democrats, for example, uh, thought that they were going to win a ma majority. Uh, but they sure were looking to take the Republican speaker out. Mm -hmm. um, I realized this. Uh, I saw, for example, that uh, the unions had put two full-time uh, employees into my two little towns to work uh, against my reelection. So, you know, I ended up going door to door. Mm -hmm. You know, probably in, in one of the two towns, I probably went to 80 or 90 percent of the doors, and in the larger of the two towns, about 60 percent of the doors. Uh, that probably made a difference, I think, mm -hmm. connecting to voters, you know, particularly in my case where uh, the Democrats had spent two years trying to in invent a persona um, that was, har for me, that was harsh and, and unreasonable and, and hateful, getting back in front of voters and saying, you know, you've, you've elected me before, haven't changed, and these are the reasons we are doing what we uh, have done up there, uh, I think that made a difference. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, any given representative, if you lose by a whole bunch of votes, probably not. If, if you lose by a few votes, then probably if you'd gone a little bit more door to door and connected with people, that can make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I saw in the two towns, the one that I spent more time mm -hmm. in going door to door, the, uh, the vote was stronger. And, it, mm -hmm. and it, that town had traditionally been the weaker of the two towns for me. So what I what I what I hear you saying is it really it, the, the adage New Hampshire retail politics at our level at the state representative level it really that really seems to make a difference when other things might be uncontrollable. It, it makes a difference around the margins, if I can put yeah. it that way. You know, uh, yes, we are a retail pol uh, a politics state. On the other hand, as I was talking before, the middle of our ballot really is subject to what's going on uh, above us. And we have a gubernatorial candidate, for example, um, who loses by 13 percentage points. That's going to really drag down a, mm -hmm. a lot of um, legislative races. Um, but, uh, uh, that being said, to the extent you can get out there and break past the you know party orientation and let people know that you know I'm I'm David or I'm Bill and I'm up there and here I, I know you've heard things about me you've heard for example in my case that we reduced spending let me tell you why we did mm -hmm. this and what what we were trying to do and the thought process that went through it you know I, I had some of these conversations when I went door to door that lasted you know an hour an hour and a half. Um, really kind of a, a time-consuming way to campaign, mm -hmm. but I think it made a difference, mm -hmm. and it was important to connect to people that way. Yeah. What, what are your plans over the next two years? You, uh, my sense is, from what I know, that had you chosen to, you could uh, have been the uh, minority leader. You chose not to uh, get involved in that. You stepped back. What was your rationale for that, and what are your plans the next two years in the legislature? Um, the reason I stepped back from that is that I had gone through a cycle where I had effectively run a substantial part of the opposition um, when the Democrats were last um, uh, in the majority and uh, had, had worked hard at it and, and uh, then when I was speaker, became speaker, in part as a result of that effort and recruiting and, mm -hmm. and representing Republican uh, interests in the House. Um, I was spending, you know, 60, 70 hours a, a week, um, and I decided that I wanted a little bit more balance in my life. You know, if, if, if uh, in fact, I had continued to be speaker, then it's worthwhile the investment of, of my time, you know, mm -hmm. 60, 70 hours a week. Um, the fact that I couldn't have 
the continuing impact that a speaker would um, led me to think, how, how do I fulfill my obligations as a, as a rep but, but have a little bit better balance in my own life? So that, that was part of the reason. Um, and the other part of the reason is that um, I want to give the uh, Republicans in the House this term an opportunity to develop a personality um, of their own, if I can mm -hmm. put it that way, a characterization mm -hmm. of their own. Um, the, the Democrats had uh, very uh, vigorously pursued something that they do quite a bit, which is to try to take conservative leaders, personify them as somehow um, evil or wrong or defective, um, and they'd done that to me, and, and um, that that persona had had uh, developed to the point that I didn't want it to be a burden this term on on House Republicans. Um, so I decided, for all those reasons, to sort of step back. You know, I'll still be active politically. There's um, things we're working on. I might seek additional office mm -hmm. um, uh, besides being. Um, a state representative, but but we'll see what develops over time. Okay. Why well, I I, uh, I am on the email list for uh, both parties, and uh, you're you're still, as you probably know, very much a uh, a rallying point and fundraiser for the Democratic state party, and uh, uh, it, it's. Uh, O'Brien dash Republicans or hyphen Republicans that are, are you know, being uh, the, being talked about. On the those Democrat sites. philosophy, particularly in um, immediate governance in the state, is not an attractive philosophy. Um, they can't go forward and say, you know, we want a little bit more, a lot more of your money, mm -hmm. so that we can spend it in ways uh, that are important to us and may not be terribly important to you because we don't think you're able to to run your, your lives as better as best as we can. Um, and so uh, you can't lead with that. You can't lead with, with the fact we want to spend more, we want to tax more, we want to control you more. So, so what they do both on a national level and a state level is, is kind of leave with the demonization of the other. And, and we'll see that. You know, look, at, look at over the years what they have done to Republican presidential candidates. You know, uh, they, Mitt Romney, for example, impresses me as being a fairly nice person. His personal life is, is exemplary. He, he uh, was successful in business. Uh, he was um, active in his church. He was a generous person on a, a personal level. We heard about all that. His, his positions on um, uh, issues were fairly moderate. Uh, and yet they made him into, you know, a constant effort to try to make him into being something evil. We saw it happen with um, Sarah Palin. We, we saw it happen um, with Dan Quayle. I met Dan Quayle, for example, for the first time um, last year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my view of him has probably been colored by the um, uh, efforts of the Democrats and the media along with everyone else. My assumption was that he wasn't going to be a person who was all that interesting, all that bright. He's a very bright person. He's a very interesting person. Um, he, he basically was demonized by uh, the Democrats to the point that he didn't have a career left. And they, maybe they think they've done that to me. Maybe they think that it's, it's, this is the way that you govern is by taking the opposition and making the opposition into people who are evil and beyond the pale. Um, I don't think so. I think, I think people are going to move past that. Well, if, while, you, while you were talking, I was thinking about a couple of things. One of them is the way that uh, many people in the Republican Party characterize and describe uh, President Obama. And uh, uh, he is demonized by uh, uh, folks in, in the Republican Party, by many folks. Um, he is, uh, uh, you know, the characterizations about him are, are, very, are very crude and cruel in many respects. And in fact, many people in, in uh, Republican office holders and in the party have indicated that uh, their, their chief desire uh, in the last election was uh, just to get him out of office. And it was more that, it appeared more that emphasis than in a, a coherent philosophy uh, put forward, at least by some people. So would, is, it, is it really a democratic kind of thing or is it uh, more both parties engage in that? It's more of a democratic type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, didn't, I, I, don't, I don't see that taking place. I see the opposition to the president 
um, being stated in, in philosophical and, and policy terms. Um, I, I think if you ask most Republicans um, of, of any sort of credibility, they'd say he seems like a fairly nice fellow. You know, he mm -hmm. seems like he, he's a, a, a good father. Um, uh, uh, he seems to be honest in his beliefs. We just don't agree with any of that. We don't agree with big government. We don't mm -hmm. agree with um, uh, him, for example, when he says um, and acts as if there's nothing exceptional about the American experience. Um, we, we just, there's, there's deep rooted uh, uh, disagreements that have nothing to do with, with who he is um, or, or what he is. Um, I, I contrast that, for example, with um, uh, the way that the Democrats will look at leader after leader of the Republican Party and somehow find character flaws and ugliness and mendacity, um, constantly turning to um, efforts to uh, portray those individuals as somehow um, defective. L l look at Ovid Lamontagne, for example. I, I don't know if you know Ovid, David. Um, uh, I, I, I've met him a few times, talked with him. My experience uh, in doing that has been positive. He seems to be a very likable fellow. He is a likable guy. And he, again, in his personal life, he's, he's uh, lived in a, an exemplary life, loyal to his community, loyal to his family, giving of himself uh, to the community. Now, you can, you can um, uh, listen to the fellow and, and, and agree with him or disagree with him on, on political aspirations and policy goals and so forth. I think everyone would have to agree that he's a, a, a nice fellow. I looked at some of the ads that were being run against him near the end of the campaign, and there was an effort to make him into somebody that he wasn't, an effort to portray him as a, as a, uh, a bad person. Um, that's just wrong. It really is. And so the fact that they want to continue to use this expression of the O'Brien uh, uh, Republicans or O'Brien slash Republicans, I, I think over time people were getting, you know, a little bit uh, tired and, and knowledgeable and tired of that kind of demonization. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, my, my experience is, is a little bit different in that score. And uh, with that said, uh, I'll move on. Uh, how do you think uh, Representative Norelli is going to do as uh, speaker? Um, she will be like she was before. Uh, she will be arbitrary in her rulings. Um, we already have seen her adjust the House rules to allow for that. Uh, you might remember when we first came into the majority uh, two years ago, one of the things that we did was change the reference of um, interpretation when it comes to um, House procedure. It had been that you first looked at House rules, then you looked at what was called precedent and tradition, and then you looked at um, the actual written rules, the mm -hmm. Masons. We changed it so that you look at House rules, which are written, Masons rules, which are written. Down, I remember that. And then, and then you look at tradition and, and precedent. And the reason that we did that is because uh, having been in the minority, we found that uh, precedent and tradition was basically in, in the eye of the beholder uh, and was uh, uh, determined on the fly. And, it, and the rulings tended to be arbitrary. Well, uh, we've gone back to House rules, even though we argued against it, that uh, put this pre precedent and tradition, which can be found um, almost nowhere other than, again, in, in impressions of the speaker, um, ahead of the written rules, Masons. Mm -hmm. And so that's an indication that, uh, uh, that there's going to be a return to the arbitrary um, approach that we saw last time she was a speaker of um, coming up with rulings that will uh, exclude um, minority participation and, and rulings that will suppress um, minority reports, as she did last time. Remember, this is the speaker that when she couldn't get a vote to suspend House rules, asked the governor to walk in uh, to the House. She adjourned the House, and they announced a new session that had no rules. Um, we will see more of that. Mm -hmm. So, so you, what, I, what I hear you saying is uh, uh, more of the same from four years ago. I, I do see more of the okay. same from four years ago. I don't see any difference at all. 
I, I, and there's no indication that it will be, um, other than there will be rhetoric of, of uh, bipartisanship. For example, uh, when we started uh, in the majority, I, I went to her and I said, you know, one of the things I'd really like to do is to intersperse the representatives together without regard to party affiliation. I said, let's just kind of mix it up. And, and she said, no, Bill, don't do that to us. You know, we're in the minority. Or mm -hmm. She said, Mr. Speaker, don't do that. We're in the minority. That's just not fair to the majority, minority. You, you should never do that. We have to have cohesiveness and so forth. And I said, gee, if you feel that strongly about it, I won't do it. Uh, and so she did it, <laughs> even though, again, the minority this time, the Republicans asked her not to. Um, and so I, I think, again, we're going to see a, sort of a cynical use of the rhetoric of, of bipartisanship. Um, but uh, in, in, in that velvet glove, there'll be a steel fist. What, uh, one of the changes, and, and I didn't realize it was a change at the time because I was so new, um, that occurred was the uh, Republican caucus two years ago elected a majority leader. In the past, uh, both parties, as I understand it, uh, majority leader has been appointed by the, uh, the speaker, speaker's leadership team, however, and then uh, the, uh, the caucus has voted on it. Um, how did that work? How did that work for us? When I say us, I mean the Republican majority over the last two years. Not as well as I'd hoped, and many of us had hoped. Um, I, I think it ended up resulting in a mixed message at times. Um, it re resulted in less Republican cohesiveness. You know, um, when you have an elected majority leader and then you know a, a speaker, there's um, less of an, uh, an opportunity to coordinate the message. You know, uh, D.J. Betancourt was, mm -hmm. was elected as majority leader. He and I were and remained very good and fast friends. Mm -hmm. um, it, but even at that, you know, there there was I think. Um, uh, a divergence in interests and roles that um, ended up making things a little bit rockier than they could have been. Okay. So if uh, if the uh, if you were faced with the same situation again, uh, what would your uh, what would your course be? Elected oh, it would be it would be uh, to recognize that just as on the Democrat side and the Republican side, there should be one elected leader. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a majority on either side, that should be the speaker. Uh, and and uh, everyone ought to carefully consider who that person was. Th this change, this experiment arose out of what was um, a, a bad incident that some of us had, had gone through in 2004. I was first elected mm -hmm. in 2004, and Gene Chandler was running for um, speaker, running for re-election for speaker. Um, about a week before organization day, um, approximately then, I, I don't recall the exact number of days, but approximately about a week before, he announced he couldn't run because, as you might recall, he was under an ethics investigation mm -hmm. and it developed to the point where he didn't think he should be running for speaker. And um, his deputy speaker, Mike Wally, announced he was running. Uh, we went into the House on organization day and uh, Mike didn't get sufficient votes to be elected speaker. And um, Doug Scammon, who was a former speaker, had run again, was in his first new term again, uh, put himself forward and um, gained a majority of uh, all the Democrat votes. That plus um, a small minority of Republican votes um, ended up getting him elected speaker. And then he turned around and elected the uh, chose the Republican leader. So you had a, a speaker elected with a majority of Democrat votes um, choosing the Republican leader, and that led to all of us to say there has to be um, a, a different way to do this. Uh, I think that the solution to that problem was worse than the problem. Well, that's uh, so we, we probably, uh, if, if, again, if the situation arises again, we probably won't see that. We probably won't see the uh, I, I think, election. I, I think the lesson learned from yeah. the last term was that um, it was a worthy thing to attempt. It had good logical reasons for doing it, and they, those reasons didn't play out on the, on the uh, ground. All right. What, uh, what's the state party going to do over the next couple of years? The, it, it does not, from the outside, it doesn't look as though the party's in terribly good shape. They're, we're going to be coming up in 
uh, electing a state party chair in the next uh, 10 days or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, what, do you, what do you see happening and what would you like to have happen and how, uh, if the Republican Party is to be reborn or revived in the state as far as uh, more elective office holders, what would you, how would you do that? Have you ever noticed when the Democrats lose an election disastrously, such as they did in 2010, barely getting 100 seats mm -hmm. in, in the House out of 400, that there's no existential crisis that takes place in, in uh, Democratic, um, uh, uh, the Democratic Party, that they don't engage in vigorous self-flagellation. They just pick themselves up and they say, what lessons do we learn in being better campaigners? Mm -hmm. what, how do we get our message across? Not that it's a wrong message. I, I think it's a terribly wrong message, but they, I, I, you don't see that sort of analysis. What you do see is they, them saying, Let's, we've got to be better at this. Um, I think there's a number within my party who truly believe that our message is a strong message. It's this message of limited government and liberty and individual rights together with individual responsibility is a message that is the right message. It resonates well with people. People identify, self-identify themselves as conservatives um, at a rate of almost twice that as those who self-identify as liberals. Um, what we have to do is get better at getting that message out to people. Um, we, we do have a party here that is not as um, integrated and, and uh, monolithic in its operation as the Democrat Party appears to be. Part of that is that we don't have the same conduit of funds that the Democrats have coming in from the unions. Um, we have nothing comparable to that. And so we don't have that sort of money to organize, both in terms of hiring staffers and, and, and being able to go to um, candidates and potential candidates say we have some money for you or we have money to use against you if you don't agree with the message. Um, and so we're always going to look a little bit uneven um, and, and chaotic compared to uh, the Democrats until there's changes in, in those areas. But we have a vigorous party. We have a lot of people who are interested in, in who's going to be um, chairman of the party, who, who's going to um, take on the subsidiary roles, how we can become successful in, in connecting with people. We, we don't have to assume that somehow or another we have to change our message. We just have to uh, get out there and get the message to people. And, and uh, there's a lot of us trying to think about the best ways we can do that. You know, um, I grew up substantially in Massachusetts. My, my dad was in the service. And when we came back um, he, from overseas, we'd been living in Germany until I was about 14, I guess. Um, we came back over, and I, I grew up pretty much from that point on in Massachusetts until I moved up to New Hampshire as a young adult. Um, went to high school there, college there, law school. And I watched during that time period the Republican Party drift away. And the, the reason it drifted away is it, is it wasn't assertive in its conservative underpinnings and its American traditional beliefs. Um, it basically said, well, you know, we're not as bad as the Democrats. We, we, we too will raise your taxes. We too will spend mm -hmm. more money on you. We too will pander to you when you come to us and say that you uh, want your particular needs to be cared for by government rather than an individual initiative. But we'll feel bad about it and we'll do it slower. That's not, a, that's not an alternate message. You know, why would you vote for people like that? And so we've seen, particularly in the Northeast, but I watch it happen in Massachusetts, the Republican Party drift away. New Hampshire always took a different approach. We had assertive conservatives here. Um, and I think that's made the difference. And I think we have to be assertive to maintain um, a viable party here. Well, it, did we not do that in 2012? Were we not assertive enough? What, what, if that would have made the difference, why didn't we do it and or what happened? We lost the presidential election. We had a, a gubernatorial candidate that, that got 13% of the vote and um, there was a wave election. You know, again, um, 
we, we, we didn't sit, no one sat back and said, you know, these, these, these Democrats have got to give up their big spending ways. They've got to get rid of all their party leadership. They have to engage in an existential discussion when in 2010 they lost disastrously. Um, rather, they picked up and said, how do we better at this? And they got very good at it, particularly at a national level. And, and the state party here was a, was a, uh, a beneficiary of that. Uh, we just have to get better at that, better at connecting with people, um, better in explaining, for example, who we are. You know, I, I, the, the, uh, the message is always going to be difficult to get out. We don't have media who's favorable to us. You know, the, the um, uh, left wing of the political spectrum has understood early on, back in before the 60s, um, that the, the way to gain control of a society is to get into schools, to get into the media, um, to perpetuate your message there, and, and they've done a very good job at that. We've, we've got to take a long-term view again of recapturing the, uh, uh, the education of our children. I think that's starting to happen now, freeing up the education of, of our children so that they become thinkers and not people who are being indoctrinated. Um, we, we also have to um, uh, develop, and it's, it's happening somewhat organically on its own, but develop alternate uh, ways of getting information to people. The internet is doing that to a certain degree. Um, and all those things are going to make a difference. Well, but we have, I mean, the, the, uh, the union leader in Manchester is the state's statewide paper. It is, uh, I don't think anybody would uh, call it anything but some shade of conservative. Um, oh, I would. It, okay. <laughs> I, would, yeah. I, think, right. I think it's much more, you know, it takes position on both issues. It has um, writers uh, for reporters who are extremely liberal. You know, um, it, it uh, uh, runs columns by Kathy Sullivan, who's the, what, the executive director, whatever position she has, but there is a position in the, in the Democrat Party, state party. Um, I think it's a much more of a middle of the road. It, it does but it those, have are, those are op-ed pieces. That Kathy Sullivan is is a regular op-ed person, and there are there are op-ed pieces in right. all of the papers that I've that I've seen. I don't I don't read the Monitor in Concord very much anymore because I'm not up there. But the Telegraph and the Union Leader, uh, they all have op-eds. They all um, right go go. I mean, but but I, I you know and again I'm not going to. Um, not again, but I will tell you that I'm not going to disparage individual reporters because there's no percentage gain in that. But I will t that some of them are quite liberal, um, uh, who write for the union leader. Um, it, it, its editorial policy is, is more moderate, more conservative perhaps at times than uh, certainly the Concord Monitor, which is um, a typical state capital uh, newspaper that's writing for state workers who tend to be um, people who are oriented to the growth of government, that's the jobs, um, and, and uh, the other newspaper, you know, the National Telegraph tends to be sort of liberal. I, and, and again, I, that, that's just the lay, that's who they are. Mm -hmm. I, I don't complain. I mean, if, if anything, the, the National Telegraph has to worry about whether it's going to be around in, in 10, 15 years, <laughs> not, mm -hmm. not, not worry about whether I think they're liberal or, or not. Um, the, you know, I, I look in my area, for example, we, there's a paper that's owned now by the Nashua Telegraph um, called the Milford Cabinet. It used to have, I believe, when I first moved into the um, area, 50 to 60 percent market penetration. 50 to 60 percent households would um, had a subscription to the Milford Cabinet. Now it's around 25 percent. Um, these papers are drifting away. And, mm -hmm. and what we have to do is, is get out there with, with better communication to folks to um, let them know what's going on, and, and uh, we'll find ways to do that. Well, but even, even so, if, if we have a good message, if we have uh, substance, and if we have a, a position, and, and uh, whether, whether, why did we nominate someone who lost by 13%? Why did, uh, looked at Kevin Smith, talked with Kevin Smith. He's a very attractive, articulate person. Don't necessarily agree with uh, his positions on many things. But he certainly provided a very clear uh, difference uh, 
with with the uh, the current Democratic governor, and yet I think he got thirty percent of the the primary vote. Is it is it a fact that that we really don't want to be that different as a party, or is it a fact that of something else? I don't know. Again, I, there's nothing existential here. That you're, you're reaching for for meaning more meaning than can be uh, read into these situations. You know. Over well, don't don't forget, I'm I'm trying to get ratings. Yeah, no, Ovid Lamatain <laughs> worked very hard at it. I mean, I I uh, uh, spent my speakership, you know, working at 60, 70, 80 hours a week, and part of it was I was out two or three nights a week, you know, speaking to whoever would listen, mm -hmm. you know, both to um, Republican groups and community groups and civic groups and so forth. Um, for the last year and a half of that effort, Ovid was everywhere, you know, and, mm -hmm. and he, he worked it very, very hard. He was a good pr primary candidate. So I, I don't think uh, the, his ability to, uh, the fact that he beat Kevin Smith in the primary um, talks to anything other than you have two good, good conservative candidates, both of whom came across as fairly attractive, and um, Ovid was better known and, and uh, had uh, in the end, more uh, exposure. Okay. All right. um, some some stuff that's that's going to be coming up um, this session. And uh, funding for Planned Parenthood, uh, gay marriage, abortion. What uh, what do you see on the horizon? And what uh, what do you think is going to happen? Well, on any particular bills, I, you know, well, I don't, I don't, I don't have bills. Outlaw abortion, Planned Parenthood, um, we'll say about the same. This is not a a a, a term of change. Mm -hmm. You have uh, a, uh, a Democrat House that, and, and you were there. You know the Democrats vote um, almost uniformly. Um, there's very little diversions uh, in their vote. If you if you have any issue that Democrat leadership is involved in. Uh, and interested in, and if out of, you know, when we were there, the 103 uh, representatives, if you had one or two who would vote against them, that would be very surprising. And, and, and you will see that be the case again. So in the Democrat House, um, the Democrat leadership will get whatever vote it wants. Uh, the, the Senate is a, uh, has a Republican uh, majority. Um, you're not going to see them um, repealing a whole bunch of, of uh, bills that we, uh, or laws that we enacted. Um, you may see some, but I think, for example, you know, school choice for uh, uh, the tax credit uh, bill that we put in place, you know, that's going to be nip and tuck, but I think in the end we're going to be able to preserve that. Um, I don't see any, any revolutionary changes. You know, one of the, the uh, more recent statements that's very interesting is I hear from the governor's office now after they spent a campaign saying, you know, not only were the cuts horrendous, but these, going back to the demonization, the people who, who pushed them were, were really bad people. Now we hear the governor saying, well, you know, we're just not going to have money or much money to restore these cuts. Um, and so, you know, I think there's going to be um, some lasting effect of, of the fiscal responsibility that we brought to, to the past term. You know, they, they, they know that they'll, they'll lose, they're going to lose anyway in 2014. It's probably going to be another wave election um, or close to it. Um, but, you know, they're going to try to preserve themselves and they don't want to provide us issues. So there, there won't be any huge tax increase. And that's what they need to, to fulfill all of Maggie Hassan's promises. They would need a very, very big tax increase, and they're not going to get it. So um, there's not going to be any big changes. Well, it, it, a couple of questions come from that. One of them is that uh, it, it's been said, or it's been thought about, at least I've thought about it, that if, uh, if we had finished the 2011 legislative year, gotten the budget passed, uh, and, and done redistricting, and then gone home, and pretty much let the 2012 legislative year be non-existent, um, we, you would probably still be speaker and I'd probably still be a state representative. How, what's your reaction to that? My reaction is to, to that is, is uh, going back to what I said before. Um, we, we have the conceit that somehow people are always paying attention to what 
we were doing up there. Um, that they knew who I was, that they knew who you were, and they were saying to themselves, ah, oh, that last vote, I can't do it. In the end, it, there's, there's not a large majority, or even a majority, who, who really pay that much attention to state politics uh, and then go out and vote during presidential years. Rather, there's a majority that go out and vote based, uh, based upon um, what they hear in the presidential race, and then their <coughs> excuse me, votes translate down to the middle of the ballot. That's what makes the difference. I mean, <coughs> excuse me, if, if, if you could have uh, told us back in you know, the, the beginning of last term what the presidential and gubernatorial vote was going to be in 2012, if you could have told us that in 2010, you could pretty much predict within you know, some 10 or 20 seats what the, the next majority of the, of the House would be. That's what makes the difference. Well, it, uh, perhaps if I run for re-election instead of, uh, in a presidential year, instead of going out and campaigning for myself, I should then cam campaign for the party uh, nominee and uh, work for his or her uh, election because I'll be carried along. Is that... I'm being somewhat facetious, but... If, if the voters who turn out in 2014 uh, had been, were the same voters as in 2012, then we wouldn't have a chance. But flip that on its, its side. If those 2014 voters were actually the ones who show, show up in 2012, you'd still be in. I'd still be speaker. Over the Lamentane may have been, 13 points is a lot of deficit, may have been governor, but... Uh, uh, certainly, Charlie Bass and Frank Enter would, would be in Congress. Okay. Well, it, it's uh, we we think of ourselves as being independent, hardy stock, and it's uh, I got to tell you, it's, it's just a tad deflating to realize that uh, uh, our, our my future is not entirely in my control. Maybe it's a good thing to learn. I remember you being here talking about having lost an election and how it was a humbling, sobering, and a, and a very good experience. Right. And, and again, around the margins, you can really make a difference. Um, and certainly, uh, as you gain a name recognition within a electoral district, it becomes um, uh, harder to dislodge someone. You know, if you, you, you can see some, on both sides, some districts that ought to belong to one party or the other, but doesn't because the person is so well known there. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, all that being taken into consideration, the most important factor um, for legislative races is what's going on in the ballot above them. Um, and if it's a wave election above them, if you have your congressional candidates losing, you have your gubernatorial candidate losing, you have a presidential candidate on the ballot, and that candidate's losing. Um, it, it's not a bad thing that you're able to eke out 179, 180 uh, uh, House seats. So you, you see this, uh, if, if I'm understanding what you're saying, you see uh, this election as, as a very natural part of the ebb and flow of uh, the political process as it, as it happens here in the state of New Hampshire. and. Uh, that uh, not to be unexpected and not necessarily a harbinger of what's going to happen two years down the road. Well, I think it is a harbinger of what's going to happen two years down the road because that ebb and flow does take place mm -hmm. and, and it will continue to take place. Um, do I think it's a, a necessary feature of New Hampshire politics? No, I don't think it's necessary. I think there's things that can be done um, in terms of uh, limiting same day, uh, limiting same day. Uh, registration, um, there's, there's other reforms that could take place to uh, allow for a, a much more um, uh, even process here in New Hampshire. But um, yeah, we, as I said, we've had, what, three, four wave elections out of the last five or six. You know, I, just, I, that's my recollection from yeah. what little I know about that. Yeah, so and <coughs> I, I don't see that changing um, right away. Okay. Um, taxes, been reading, reading the newspaper, listening to the news uh, a little bit, and uh, uh, the governor has, has just said she would veto, a uh, if it came to her, a, an increase in the uh, liquor tax, a tax on beer from 30 to 40 cents a gallon. Um, 
but she is open to other taxes. And uh, David Campbell, who is a uh, uh, representative from Nashua, is the chair of the Public Works, House Public Works Committee, uh, is in favor of uh, increasing the gas tax four cents over the next three years plus a $5 registration fee, uh, targeting this money toward uh, infrastructure. What are your thoughts? My thoughts, my thought is it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that there are funds taken out of the Highway Trust Fund um, that don't go to the repair, maintenance, or the development of highway infrastructure. You know, funds, for example, to run the um, uh, state police um, uh, unit that investigates capital crimes. Um, for, and there's a number of different um, uh, uses of money that is inappropriate. Uh, so I, I think there's ways to recapture money that would be um, uh, should be used in, in to repair highways and to, to develop them. In addition, I said there's two reasons. The second reason is that New Hampshire Department of Transportation is very unproductive. If you look at North Dakota as an example, North Dakota has twice the um, high, uh, state highway miles, miles of roads um, as in New Hampshire. And yet, it maintains those for half the cost of the New Hampshire Department of Transportation. Even Maine has twice the state road mileage of, um, of New Hampshire, and yet it only costs $100 million more, about 20% more, to maintain the roads in Maine than New Hampshire. Uh, we have to look at a couple of things. One is right to work. We have to have... Um, the uh, ability to run our department, uh, the New Hampshire Department of Transportation, with some people who aren't forced to be in a union um, and are willing to work hard um, to, for individual gain. In addition, we have to look at privatization. Um, you know, I've, I've heard stories, now, you know, there's always a concern when you base public policy on, on anecdotes. But nonetheless, I think that I've heard stories like this too often to think that they're not um, uh, some validity. I've heard, for example, of, of uh, the state replacing a culvert up in Grafton County, you know, way up north, um, and using crew, a crew from the uh, southern part of the state to do it. And so that crew, you know, gets in its truck every day and takes a couple hours to get up there. Um, works for two, three, four hours on the, uh, on the culvert replacement and then drives back. Um, a private contractor would never do that, you know. Um, and so you have uh, uh, much more money being spent to do the work than is necessary. So, you know, let's, let's close the holes on the, on the use of the funds. Let's look at privatization. Let's get right to work in New Hampshire. I, I, help me out on this. I, I honestly... You know, right to work has been a, a very big issue, and, and it's got two components, uh, as I see it. One of them is private sector and public sector, and uh, there, there, are, uh, there, there are differences, certainly. But how, how would right to work, and if you could just define it for folks who may not, uh, the three folks who may not be aware of it in the right. state, how would right to work make a difference as far as saving money for New Hampshire taxpayers, with, you for did, state employees. You, because you'd have more efficient workers. Let, let me give you um, a personal example. Uh, when I was in college, I worked at a warehouse for a, uh, a hospital. Mm -hmm. And you know, I worked there pretty much all four years I was in college. For the first couple of years, there was no union in there. Um, and uh, I used to work very, very hard because I was getting raises every four months, five months. You know, Every year, I'd get two or three raises. Um, because I'd, I'd really work hard, try to take on additional hours, try to figure out more efficient ways to do my job. Um, and uh, then the union came in. I voted against it, but nonetheless, it came in. And for the last two years I was there, I, I would receive no raise whatsoever because the union um, uh, was involved in you know, negotiations for those, that two-year period with, with management, and they weren't successful. Now, in the end, as an individual, 
um, my incentive was no longer to work hard to try to figure out better ways to do that job. Um, it was rather to figure out how I could show up and earn the paycheck and not work so hard. Uh, that's the difference. That is, if, if, you have, if, if I were a young person now and, and uh, I, had, I wanted to go to work for the state of New Hampshire, I'd have to join a union. And that would be probably something that, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't do because I wouldn't want to be in an environment where well, personal initiative doesn't make a difference. I, I just want to interject for a second. You wouldn't have to join a union would you you would be required to pay what's called an agency fee if you chose not to join which would be normally less than union dues and is designed at least on paper to cover the cost of uh, contract negotiation and contract yeah. implementation yeah. Um, it is, yeah 75 percent of the union dues so effectively okay. you're paying the union dues you work in an environment that is is um, uh, subject to union work rules you're subject to union people who don't want to be uh, uh, working with someone who's taken personal initiative, it changes the atmosphere of employment entirely. Um, I, I think particularly when with state employment, you know, you've asked generally about right to work, and I want to relate it to the, mm -hmm. the uh, availability of funds to maintain our roles, but, but nonetheless you have to look at the larger picture, and the larger picture is that um, if someone wants to work for the state of New Hampshire, they shouldn't have to pay money to an organization that is using the money in ways that are against their, their beliefs. Um, and and it, it being required to associate that way is mm -hmm. violation of liberty. It's bad economics. It's bad um, when you, you force a state to employ um, union employees or people who have to pay into the union. Um, and and uh, I think in, in the particular instance I was bringing up with a more efficient workforce at the Department of uh, transportation, which you would have without forced unionization, you'd get more productivity. North Dakota gets double the uh, productivity as we get out of state employees in New Hampshire working at Department of Transportation, and it's a right to work state. Those aren't union employees. Now, was it, um, was it Indiana that uh, just became a. Uh Mitch Daniels. Mitch um, Daniels was yeah. it in a right to work, uh, right, a right, right to work state. Right. Um, what do you do? You think that there is anything in that happening that's translatable in the near future to New Hampshire? Uh, you know, I uh, we worked hard to override Governor Lynch's veto of, of the right to work bill we passed. Um, we weren't able to do it, and shortly thereafter, Mitch Daniels uh, signed a law that, that uh, made Indiana a right-to-work uh, state. Within a matter of days, Caterpillar announced it was closing up a union plant in Ontario and moving that work to Indiana. I have heard, and I believe I have this figures right, that uh, at least they were as of um, the election in November, that at that point in the time period between um, Mitch Daniels signing that law and the election, that one out of every six new jobs that had been formed in the United States were formed in Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is, uh, it, it is something that produces a dynamic economy. Um, it, again, it's right for liberty. It, 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 just as you have a right to, to associate, you have a right not to associate. And, and you shouldn't tell people that just because there had been an election, either a private employer or certainly the state, uh, sometime in the past that they have to join a union whose goals, and particularly the political goals, may be something they don't agree with whatsoever. Um, uh, but it's good for, it's good for uh, economically as well. Mm -hmm. it, it makes a big difference for a state. Um, the Wall Street Journal had an article when we were involved in our veto override effort uh, that uh, was authored, uh, uh, written by uh, Arthur Laffer and um, Stephen Moore. And they concluded as a result of their analysis that uh, the uh, advantage New Hampshire would get if it became a right to work state would be as large as the advantage it has regionally of not having an income tax. Mm -hmm. um, that has worked very well for New Hampshire over the years. This could work well for New Hampshire over the years to come. So I, I uh, would it be fair to say that your, uh, your opinions on right to work have not changed? 
No, I think it's yeah. very important. You know, and, and uh, I am sponsoring legislation um, this term once mm -hmm. again to um, bring right to work uh, uh, laws in New Hampshire. I, you know, I hold no illusion, but I think we have to keep the issue in front of people. And I think um, that folks, as they look at representatives uh, once again, uh, and to the extent that they um, are voting, particularly in primaries, because that's that's where these mm -hmm. issues really play themselves out. Um, that they look at you know, right to work legislation and vote on right to work. Right. We've got a, only got three or four minutes, and uh, I've got uh, a couple of pages of uh, questions, so I'll I'll try to cover things quickly. And I'll give you one word to answer. <laughs> 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 Remember the old Alan Ludden show password and the words go back and forth. Okay. Um, gun control uh, from from a state on a state level. Anything there? What what are your thoughts? Uh, is there anything that the legislature and, and the governor could should or should not do? Uh, yeah, the, the the state should pass um, a constitutional right to carry uh, law. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, says that individuals can carry concealed weapons without having to get permission from the state. That's what the Second Amendment's all about, after, after all, I, I view it. The last thing in the world we ought to do is extend these, these gun-free killing zones. Um, uh, the representative, the, uh, Speaker Norelli proposed, and, and uh, with pretty much a party-line vote, we've, uh, we've put that in place in, in the New Hampshire House once again, where um, in New Hampshire, representatives and people who are in the gallery can't um, have personal protection, converting that area into essentially a gun-free killing zone. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, if you um, are sick enough to want to kill somebody and to, you know, commit suicide by mass murder, which is what a lot of these um, mass shootings come from, you, you, you don't go to, um, for example, the police um, firing range to do it. <laughs> you, you go to places where people aren't supposed to have guns mm -hmm. um, because you won't be challenged. We ought to not to have more of those. New Hampshire House ought not to be such a place. Should, uh, should individual cities and towns look at putting uh, armed, trained people in schools? I, I think the proposal that had been made by the Democrats some decades back to look at that, I think, is a worthwhile policy to look at. Um, I certainly... Um, uh, al allowing adults, teachers, janitors, administrators to be armed will send a message to folks um, or anyone who, who might uh, think of misusing a firearm at a school that uh, there could be immediate opposition. Um, you know, did, I, did I just hear you say that this is something that has been uh, promoted by Democrats in the past? Or oh, I'm yes. Oh, yes. Please, can you, can you take a second and, and speak to that? Oh, sure. About uh, 30 years ago, there was a um, proposal that had been discussed by Democrats on the national level to um, put armed guards in school. Um, the only thing that uh, is different now in the NRA's proposal in, in terms of the Democratic opposition to it is that the NRA is proposing it. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I recall, I won't take too much time um, on this, hopefully, but um, Mark Stein, who's a, who's a writer I respect, lives in New Hampshire, was talking about how on the evening of 9-11 uh, back in 2001, um, some um, uh, youth in the central city in England, uh, some, some Pakistani immigrant kids, Muslims, um, were celebrating. They were pretty happy about uh, what had happened to America. And in the course of the celebration, they started overturning cars, you know, they're coming to these intersections, they had roused out the, mm -hmm. some British couple and they'd overturn the car and set it on fire and that's the way that they were uh, celebrating uh, what they perceived to be a, a, a jihadist victory. Mark Stein, who was up in the Hanover area, saying that, that would never happen in New Hampshire. And the reason it wouldn't happen, you wouldn't even start doing it, is because you'd come to about the third car and the old guy would get out with a gun and shoot you if you tried to overturn his car. and and. A well-armed society is a polite society, is a non-violent society. There's a reason why our, our murder rate in New Hampshire is only 0.9% uh, persons per 100,000, one of the lowest in the Western world. And it's because this is a society where people are generally armed, or at least if you're going to go into a public area, a restaurant or whatever, you have a pretty good idea that there's probably you have enough people in there. There's going to be somebody who is is uh, has personal protection. It controls behavior. Schools ought to be the same way. And with that, we're we're at time. It's uh, a good place to 
to leave on, on being polite and civil. Uh, thank you very much. Thank for you, really, David. really appreciate your yeah. being here, and, and uh, it's been illuminating for me and, and very interesting, and I hope it has for our, for our visitors. And uh, I will look into a camera that has a light on it and say for, uh, for Ken Gidge, who's not here tonight, and, and myself, we thank former Speaker O'Brien, and uh, we'll see you next week. Take care now. Bye-bye.